Our next speaker is Ivana Svijevic from Harvard. Hi there. So my name is Ivan Svijovic. I'm a graduate student in Michael Desai's lab. And I'm really excited to tell you today about some recent work that we've done to theoretically predict the effects of purifying selection on genomic diversity. Now, purifying selection is thought to play an important role in shaping genomic diversity. And specifically, it's predicted, we, we understand its major effects as a sort of reduction of diversity in conserved regions. Now, this reduction happens not only at conserved sites, but also at closely linked neutral regions. And the mental picture that we have that explains this is whenever deleterious variants arise in the population, selection will act to quickly remove these alleles. And in doing so, it will also remove any neutral variants that have accumulated in close linkage before recombination can move them to a better background. This is formalized in the background selection model. And a prediction of this picture is that if we, d there will be typically a split of, uh, sorry, a spread of fitnesses in the population uh, as a result of sort of continuous deleterious mutations that arise. But any deleterious individuals that we may find in the population carry new deleterious alleles. And so they're recently descended from some individual that has no mutation. And so if we were to look back at this population, at the ancestors of our sample backwards in time, we will soon find that they're all in the most fit class. And from this point backwards, sort of the genealogical process is explicitly neutral. Now, what we can do is neutral mutations accumulate sort of uniformly along the branches of genealogy. So we can visualize where they are in order to understand sort of the, the approximations of the background selection model. So what the background selection model does is says it's the time to purging these deleterious variants is so short that we can ignore it and say that the diversity is like that of a neutral population with effective size equal to the mutation-free class. Now, clearly, unless all of these mutations are uh, sorry, lethal, in which case we would never even see these individuals, we can theoretically predict that there should always be sort of an excess of, of rare alleles compared to the background selection model. And so understanding these full genealogies is important because we're often interested in looking at natural populations and looking at basically how patterns of geno genomic diversity vary across the genome and using that, using the best model we have, which is the background selection model, to infer some sort of coefficient which will characterize the strength of selection. However, uh, given that I've told you that there is this sort of theoretical confounder, we can also look at the data and see whether we see any evidence of there being any confounding effects due to these rare variants. So we can, what we can do is we can look at the minor allele frequency, which should be reduced if we have an excess of rare alleles. And in fact, we do see that. So for example, this is data from the Thousand Genomes Project, which shows that basically in all populations from the Thousand Genomes Project, you see a dip in minor allele frequency exactly in those re near those regions where we would like to apply the background selection model. Right. So this theoretical founder has long been recognized as important. And currently, we understand it well in scenarios where all mutations have the same effect on fitness. And the reason this case is sort of easier to understand than others is whenever all mutations have the same effect on fitness, then there's only a small, a discrete number of fitnesses that any individual can have. And so what this leads to in practice is there being sort of a stable structure in time. And so we can treat this case by making an analogy between our selected population and sort of a spatially structured neutral population in which the different fitness classes correspond to deems and the mutation events are thought of as migrations to reconstruct these genealogies. And once we do have a genealogy, we sort of scatter uh, mutations, neutral mutations along their branches and calculate any diversity statistic that you may like. Now, we would like to do the same in the sort of more biologically realistic scenario where you have, where all mutations are not created equal. And we can, in this case, we can sort of try going through the same exercise. We can calculate an average distribution. Now it will be much more spread out because you can have any fitness and it will be much lower. But 
basically, if we look at any individual population, we'll see that the population fitness distribution looks nothing like the average. And even worse, if you look at how it fluctuates, we'll see that it sort of changes in time. There are these peaks that are sort of fluctuating in this complicated way. And there are currently no coalescent methods that can reconstruct these genealogies in a structure that is sort of moving underneath your feet. I'd like to emphasize that this average distribution is not wrong. It's just not representative of any instantaneous population. But what we can think of it as representing sort of the average across many in independent populations. So at this point, this sounds like some sort of annoying, irrelevant technical detail. Like, why does it matter? Can't we just think of this, uh, whatever we infer, representing some sort of average? And the answer is unfortunately not. It does matter. So, for example, if we look at how severe these distortions are uh, as a result, uh, as a function of the effect of selection, in a single, uh, single fitness effect model, we find that the distortions are most severe at intermediate fitnesses. Now, if we looked at an alternative model where the distribution of effect sizes is exponential, we find that the biggest distortions actually happen at the strongest fitnesses. This is something we can formally prove, but I don't have time to go into this now. The exponential distribution never reaches the background selection limit, not even in infinite population sizes. So how do we do go about making theoretical null predictions uh, for diversity statistics? There's always the possibility of forward time simulations but there are two problems with these. One is forward time simulations are computationally expensive. So for each and every one of the points that I'm showing you on the graph above, uh, it takes a few hours to simulate it. But there's a deeper issue over here. Whenever you have a continuous dis distribution, now you have sort of an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So it's unclear even which parameters you should vary. We don't even have a theoretical understanding of which parameters are the important ones. Okay. So a key insight that we have used that has sort of made this problem tractable is noticing that this distribution is not fluctuating in some sort of random, intractable way, but that these peaks that we see sort of, uh, sorry, they represent individual clones, that they, ha they have sort of a geneal genealogical logic to their own. And so if we could use our insights, our understanding of the dynamics of individual clones, Maybe, oh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe we could, we could do something uh, to reconstruct how this structure is varying as a function of time and then reconstruct uh, the individual gene genealogies within it. Now, this is still a hard problem because these clones are fluctuating stochastically. They may be interacting in some sort of complicated way, but it's tractable. And we've called this method that does this uh, the bubble coalescent in reference to sort of the transient presence of the clones in the population. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to give you some, a graphical representation of how the bubble coalescent works on a very simple example in which you're trying to reconstruct all the possible genealogies for a sample of three individuals. You start the simulation at present, and initially you know nothing about the population. There are some peaks in the population, but you don't know where they are. And so your best guess is given by the average distribution. And so you sample an individual from this average of in distribution. Now I've sampled this blue individual. What that's telling me is that there is a clone at that position. Um, and so I can update my information about which clones I have in this population. And I can do this sort of iteratively until I've sampled the right number of individuals that, that, I, that I seek to have in my sample. And then we, bas we can basically simulate the clonal dynamic ba dynamics backwards in time. And so what we'll see happen, for example, is so this brown clone is now sort of starting to disappear. We would sort of expect this. It started at a really low fitness. And so kind of the intuition is a new allele. So what does this clone disappearing mean? It means that a deleterious mutation happened at that point in time uh, that created that brown clone. And so we can use what we know about the extant points at that uh, extant clones at that disappearance point, the average distribution and the distribution of effect sizes, which is telling us about the available uh, mutations, uh, to basically tell us where this where this clone likely came from. Where was this originating? Where was the most likely originating uh, mutation? 
And so in this case, we may find that the ancestral clone uh, was a an already known clone, this orange clone over here. And so we continue this process, uh, and now, okay, now we see the blue clone disappearing. Uh, all we know about right now is that there's this orange clone. Uh, that one seems small, and it turns out to be very unlikely that it originated. So we can do some math to figure out where an unsampled ancestral clone was uh, that the blue clone originated from. And we continue this process until all of the clones have coalesced in the single one. And what we've done in, in this way is basically we've reconstructed the clone genealogy. And we can fairly simply sort of embed the individual genealogy within the clone genealogy, scatter neutral mutation, and calculate any statistic that we want. And so we repeat this process as many times as we want to get good averages. Um, now, we could use the same sort of intuition and the same scheme to analytically uh, calculate these diversity statistics, and this is possible in, uh, in some very simple cases. But there is really no need for this. The bubble coalescent is fast. It simulates uh, entire population uh, in, in, in its, on timescales from a few minutes, to, sorry, seconds to minutes, which should be compared to a few hours for forward time simulations. So I've told you that it's fast, but is it accurate? So what I, will I be showing you over here are two diversity statistics. The mean reduction in pairwise diversity, what is common, commonly called B, and the average minor allele frequency. And I'm showing you these statistics for four different types of models where all, the, uh, sorry, the effects, um, the mutation rates are kept constant and the harmonic mean fitness is kept constant. But the shape of the distribution of effect sizes is a gamma distribution with different shapes. And so the background selection model would predict that it does that, sorry, the, the diversity statistics should not be, uh, depend on the size of the population. They should all be the same for all of these points. And if you run forward time simulations, what you find is that not only do all of these lines essentially deviate from the background selection predictions, but they also deviate from each other. And so the mutation rate and the harmonic feet, mean fitness are not sufficient to predict diversity statistics. We can also look at how the bubble coalescent does on the same plot, and we see that it does actually capture most of the deviations from, um, from, fr from the background selection limit. It struggles a little bit at weak fitnesses, but this is something that we're currently working on. And so I, I would like to end by thanking my advisor, Michael, and Ben Good, who is another uh, graduate student in the lab who I've collaborated with, and I'll take any questions. Um, so I gather uh, so far this is all with no recombination. Can you implement recombination in the bubble coalescent? Mm -hmm. This is something that we, sorry, back up slide, here it is. So I guess the idea is uh, you, can, you can sort of use, this, this is the first part of the problem, really, understanding how the part, uh, how the coalescence time scale depends on both like the mutational density and the selective effects. And so once you know how that depends, then you can, uh, then it's conceivable, you can basically extend it to uh, a sexually reproducing population where everything that I've said basically applies to blocks of the genome. And so the length of these blocks will of course depend on the time to mo uh, most recent common ancestor. This will depend on the parameters we know. And so there's a self-consistency condition that you can use to apply this to recombining populations. And this is something we would like to do in the future. All right, thank you very much.